Welcome to Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Pam. Dr. Pam has been a psychotherapist for over half a century. He participated in the civil rights movement in the South. He is the author of three books, including historical the historical novel, When Black Panthers Prowl, uh, Prowled America. Welcome to Politics Done Right, Dr. Pam. How are you doing today? Oh, fine. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Uh, first of all, let me ask you a question. Why did you write that book? Well, I felt the Panthers uh, are very relevant to what's happening today. But I started writing that book 10 years ago, 15, maybe even 15 years ago, um, because I was always concerned about ra racial issues in this country. Um, and uh, the, the Panthers were a, a pivotal point um, um, in, in the North and what happened in the North. But in the South, we know the civil rights movement uh, was active there, and I was part of that. I went to Mississippi in 1964 um, as part of the um, volunteer project under Martin Luther King um, to register voters. I spent a thousand college students went down there, um, although uh, I was a little older than most, and um, and um, we tried to register voters and. Um, we did not succeed. <laughs> we did not succeed in red. And three of us were killed right at the beginning of the project by the Klan. So you were with, uh, I don't remember their, <laughs> I can't believe I forgot their names right now, but you were a part of that same tour where those three activists got killed. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Swerner, Cheney, and Goodman. I think. Thank you. I appreciate you. I, 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 I the names just kind of slipped me. Cheney and Goodman. Okay. Now let let me ask you this. Uh, I want before we get into the context of uh, your book or the concept of of the Black Panthers, etc. Uh, you got a lot of pushback. You said you were uh, pretty much canceled from publishing this book with any one of the publishers, right? Tell me a little yes. bit about that. Yes. Well, I published the book under the name Pam. That is my name. That's my last name. Um, but I uh, concealed my uh, racial identity and my gender, and gave me the impression as a female black woman writing the book uh, because of cancel culture. Cancel culture uh, today uh, has a concept called a cultural appropriation. You mm -hmm. may have heard of that in which uh, white authors writing about black issues um, are, are criticized and rejected as trying to make money off the black community. Of course, I haven't made any money at all. I've spent money on this project. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, and that only black people can really understand black culture. Um, so, um, now, cultural appropriation has gone on forever. It's part of uh, artistic license that people can write about whatever they want. Other people can react to that the way they want. Um, but um, the publishing industry has, has not wanted to run afoul of cultural appropriation. So they don't, they tend not to publish books by white authors about black subjects. Um, and so that happened to me. A number of uh, uh, agents, a number of uh, editors, and in one case, a publisher, um, once they found out that I was white, would not publish this, would have nothing to do with this book. And they would have published it if I were black. Well, let me tell, let, let me interrupt you there because I, I I want to be straight with our audience here. First of all, I don't quite believe in a cancel culture. I don't but then that, that's why you're here. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the other thing, the other thing that I don't believe in is that uh, white people, I, I, I think it is silly to say white people cannot uh, write about, let's say, particularly black issues when a lot of black issues are directly responsible to what, what white people have done to black people, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is quite it, it is quite apt for um, for white people to give a perspective as to what this in this inter interracial I, I hate to say interracial because i don't really believe in race per se but we know america as a racial society has actually uh you know it didn't become a racial society because uh, uh 
of, of, of black folk or white folks, the interaction thereof that creates this. So I think it is sort of silly to say that, um, you know, what are you going to write about if you want to write about the, the issues among races? I'm sorry. So that's the reason you're here. I want to hear your story. And um, I don't fall under that domain. Okay, very good. Well, um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so anyway, the book does have, uh, at the very end of it, an author's note, which uh, does explain why um, I uh, perhaps misled some buyers um, uh, by, by my name. Um, and the, the picture of a black woman panther on the very front cover to give that impression, but to explain why I did this. Well, I don't think, let me let me just tell you, Dr. Pam, I don't think you needed to do that. I, I like what you did, which is self-published. I have three books myself and I asked nobody for permission. I just self-published a damn book and got it out there. So I think that's what, I think you did the, the right thing in the way you published it. I don't believe in impersonation either, but that said, um, is this story that you're talking about here, um, I think it's, you said it's fictional, but it pretty much goes, it, it, it pretty much follow fact-based occurrences. Is that true? Yes, exactly true. It's a historical novel. Uh -huh. uh, and people of my generation, as they read the book, they keep saying, oh my God, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. Um, so the book is, tells the story of the the Black Panther Party, uh, through the eyes of a female, uh, a black female journalist, Neff. covering them. Her name is Neff in the book, short yeah. for Nefertiti, and, uh, and she actually falls in love and has an affair, a long-lasting affair, uh, with the head of the Black Panther Party, which is which was Huey P. Newton, uh, out of Oakland, California, and that's where the Panthers got started in 1967. Um, and as the civil rights movement wound up in the South, having achieved the voter registration legislation that it wanted, the Mississippi, the project in Mississippi helped draw a lot of attention to that issue, especially when the three people were killed. Um, and, um, and then the bridge at Selma, uh, Alabama, that was the last straw. And Johnson stepped in and passed that legislation. So what we what we set out to do in the South was accomplished. And now all eyes turn northward, and the, and there the Black Panther, uh, the Black Power movement got started with Stokely Carmichael, who had been on the project. Did you know him? I met him, but uh, just briefly as part of a crowd. Um, I mean, I didn't have a personal relationship with him, but but he did speak to us, came to our project. I was stationed in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Um, also, um, uh, also relevant, I met a, a woman who had been um, <clears throat> also on the project, and we both went back to school after the summer, both of us in, to Buffalo, New York, and we fell in love. It's an, it was an interracial marriage. We have two children, both now lawyers. Um, but and our marriage was very much affected by the Black Power movement in the North. And uh, so the Panthers took the Black Power movement to its extreme. Um, what Huey P. Newton did was organize a Black militia <laughs> armed to the teeth, um, recruited from ex-convicts and gangbangers. No college students, no intellectuals, just guys from off the, the hood. <laughs> um, and um, he had they dressed up in black leather clothing and black beret and marched around with rifles and shotguns and confronted the police in the ghetto. And their signature issue was, as, as it still is, police brutality. Um, so they confronted them with guns. And so they were the media, when television particularly, when went crazy because they had get these spectacles of the a line of panthers holding rifles and so forth, confronting a line of police and holding on to their batons. <laughs> and the tension that something could go wrong here. Um, but things did go wrong. Uh, um, um, the Panthers um, 
had a, an agenda. And that agenda was they threatened America with a civil war, with a, a guerrilla style uprising, similar to what the Viet Cong was doing, based on what the Viet Cong was doing in Vietnam. Um, and they were going to shoot police officers, ambush police officers, raid government offices, raid corporate offices, um, <clears throat> if they didn't get black rights, the, the rights that black people were entitled to. And they would point out all the ways in which people in urban ghettos were- Let me, let me interrupt a second, because I, I don't want the audience to uh, come to the conclusion that let's say the Black Panthers was only made up of, um, of criminals or folks out of jail or anything like that. They actually had social policies that they wanted to, that they, that they actually instituted throughout uh, the country to, to okay. actually uplift the Black folks. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I'm just going to go there and you're right. Of course. So, um, so it, the, the audience, because violence was threatened, um, Huey P. Newton wanted people that were familiar with it and had uh, resentment at the at the cops, whom they called referred to as pigs. Well, that was the word for cops at the time, and then and also uh, um, corrections officers, whom they referred to as screws. Um, and um, so the it, violence came easily to that group, but they were very disciplined. He didn't just he didn't just uh, allow them to run roughshod. They were very much under his control, and um, um, and they had a political agenda of certain rights that they wanted: decent housing, decent schools for their kids. You know, um, sanitation, picking up the trash from their streets. Um, and so forth. Um, but he also realized um, that he needed to broaden his outreach, as you already mentioned, um, to the black community as a whole, and not just be uh, uh, the, the, this particular group of uh, guys that he recruited. Um, and there he split with uh, his second in command, Eldridge Cleaver. Eldridge Cleaver wanted to start the revolution immediately. And in fact, he did ambush police car um, uh, um, and himself had to, had to leave the country and went into exile in Algeria with Panthers who believed in a revolution this minute, start it now, start shooting up the police, um, and went to join him. But Huey P. Newton did not believe that. He thought that if we were going to have a, a revolution and a, a com and, a, and a communist agenda, um, they would need the support of the entire black community. And so he developed community programs and recruited people into the party. Uh, and the party became more female than male even uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, set up community programs. Uh, amongst them, the Breakfast for School Children program, uh, free breakfast. So the kids were going to school, no one went to school hungry. Um, so they could learn. Uh, he set up free medical uh, clinics on the weekend, and particularly checking for sickle cell anemia. Uh, he set up free legal clinics on the weekend for those who are having problems with uh, the law. Um, uh, he, uh, he, cre he set up a liberation school, a private academy for Black children in the ghetto, uh, where they would get a, a very good education. Um, um, so he created all these community-based program, but that would take time. He was not for revolution now. Um, and, uh, but meanwhile, the police would be confronted uh, in the ghetto whenever they misbehaved, which was often. Uh, and, uh, uh, and meanwhile, of course, in the country, every time um, the police killed, you almost always, the police forces were almost always pretty much all white in major cities. Whenever they killed uh, some guy in the ghetto for some reason, sometimes for no reason, and oftentimes unarmed, um, <clears throat> there would be riots. And he would be doing and said, no, we have to control these riots. We have to, we have to discipline the entire black community. 
the state of riots just deteriorate into looting. And that gives everybody a you know, bad name. But we want to make it a revolutionary force. And um, if need be, we'll have to overthrow this government and secede. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, but he was very patient and very, very smart. Um, and uh, P Panther chapters sprung up all over the country, but all under, supposedly under his control. But the New York chapter and the Los Angeles chapters were loyal to El Eldridge Cleaver, not to him. So there was a split in the party. Um, so what did they accomplish? Well, there were sporadic uh, uh, killings on both sides, policemen killing Panthers who were resisting arrest, uh, or according to the police, resisting arrest, Panthers ambushing police cars, squad cars, uh, which, which they did. Um, and then there would be a, a series of show trials in which the Panthers demonstrated outside, you know, free Huey, but he was accused of killing a police officer and very unclear circumstances, whether he did or, he did or not, or what, how that happened. Um, he had, actually, he had uh, three trials. <laughs> and finally, they gave up on, because a black, even if one black was on the jury, they could not get a conviction. <laughs> Nobody would convict him. Um, and so, um, and so that went on. So um, <clears throat> that drew the attention of J. Edgar Hoover, uh, of course, uh, because they were preaching revolution. And uh, if you see the movie, uh, uh, what is it called? Judas and the Black Messiah that recently came out a couple of years right. ago. They talk, they, they show a Fred Hampton in California who was in uh, Chicago, who was the head of a chapter in Chicago. A very young man. He was only 21 years old. Got killed, um, yeah. He got killed, but he was preaching revolution, killed cops, you know, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> and then he was killed. Pretty much an FBI assassination plot. Pretty much, pretty obviously that. And Hoover felt that the Panthers were the number one security problem in the United States, bigger even than the Communist Party. And so he organized a whole program to infiltrate them, expose them, um, and get them to fight with each other, which was very easy to do because Eldridge Cleaver and Huey Newton were at, hated each other eventually. And with them, eventually, Panthers were killing each other. <laughs> um, uh, so that drew his attention. But with that movie, is uh, I found that movie very troubling because. They make J. Edgar Hoover doing what he did because he was a racist, purely out of racism, whereas the Panthers were avowedly a revolutionary and communist party. Um, and he could not, you know, uh, intent on um, uh, confront, you know, fighting the government or the agents of the government, like, like, like the police, and he had to address them. Let me let me let me let me interrupt you there for a second because um I want to challenge that you said um uh, that he that he did have to uh, address them because they were maybe in, in your in your parlance anti government etc. I uh, was a condition of black people uh, in that time uh, uh, racially motivated in the way they were treated by the government. In other words, were they considered subs were they given substandard resources? Yes. Okay, were were they given substandard education, substandard just about everything? Yes. Uh, and uh, did they make any types of attempts to change that? Me meaning, were there people within the community trying to change that peacefully throughout time? Yes, but they were didn't succeed. Right. And the next question is: uh, in in our in the genesis of our country, isn't it true that when the uh, when the our original founding fathers, the revolutionaries, didn't get the outcomes that they wanted from the, the the throne, that they picked up arms to fight what was actually, what they considered putting them down? Yes. So uh, that, was, that was exactly their ideology. And, exactly. So, and, so my question and, is for those who, and again, I'm a peaceful guy, a very peaceful guy, but I mean, I, I am also uh, circumspect in the way I come to conclusions. And I don't know if we should come to the conclusion that Edgar Hoover 
had, uh, you know, had this right to protect the state from those who were just trying to acquire rights, right? I mean, that's what that's what was the genesis of the Black Panther, right? Yes. Well, it's, uh, he had to he had to protect the government from an insurrection, an insurrectionary force, and uh, so he regarded the Panthers as going too far. Um, the Panthers, on their side, felt that this is what was necessary to do. So now, as the author of this book, uh, Dr. Tom, as the, I mean, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Sam, I'm sorry. As the author, I mean, Dr. Pam, uh, what, what's wrong with my mind today? Uh, as, the, as the author of this book, right? Um, I imagine, uh, even though it's a novel, I would love to hear your thoughts as far as um, the, you know, because our country has a tendency to put people in different corners and demonize some and not demonize the other. We can take a look at how Brett Forbes stole a million dollars or more, and mm -hmm. it's no big deal, but we get some black kid in a 7-Eleven who steals a candy bar and it's the mm -hmm. end of the world. He gets shot. A guy named Michael Brown gets shot, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, ha we, we have perspective. And earlier you spoke about... Um, People talk about appropriation. I don't, I, 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 this is going to sound funny. I don't have a problem with appropriation. I think everybody appropriates everybody. I, I have a problem with the financial exploitation of appropriation. In other words, that you can, uh, that you can write a black book. I have no problem about that. Or book about black folks. I write a book about white folks. I have no problem about that uh, at all. The, the thing about it is we should have equal access to do those things and equal access to profit from those things, right? And uh, and from what I've seen from what you're writing about, you're putting out your perspective, which you have the freedom to do in this country. So going back to where we left off as far as the, the section as Edgar Hoover thought he had to do something about the Black Panthers. That's where you were. Right. Okay. Well, I'm so... He went too far. He went way too far. And he, um, um, but it was a very tense time. It was a very difficult time. And there was a lot of violence going on back and forth. Um, <clears throat> so that was one issue. Um, <clears throat> uh, but the Panthers, um, they were scary. And that's, in fact, I think that was the best thing about them. <laughs> they scared the hell out of whites, <laughs> and they still do. <laughs> Even the, the recent uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement was scary to whites. Um, oh, uh, uh, the, no, no, no. The black it was scary to some whites uh, yes, okay. because the movement had a lot of whites in it. The black, the Black Lives Matter movement has a lot of white people in it. Absolutely right. Okay, so but it did scare. A lot of people, and you, the president <laughs> included, um, the Republicans by and large, um, at least the ones that speak publicly. Um, so, but that's that was what was needed really was to scale the white community, and they accomplished something which was not what they set out to accomplish, but it was a wonderful accomplishment, which was they forced urban police departments to hire minorities. The higher blacks, and that—that's the biggest difference between now and then. Um, for example, in New York, well, New York City, the police force is majority minority. <laughs> there are white cops, but they are not in the majority, uh, um, and that's true. In, I think pretty much in every city across the country now, and that—that's also that also is true for. Um, uh, prosecutors and judges. Um, and it was because the Panthers were a scary bunch that white people made these changes um, to deal with them. Um, so um, so that I, I think that's so important, you know, what they did accomplish, um, although there's still room for police reform, obviously, and the Black, Black Lives Matter pr uh, protest movement, which I support, you know, uh, demonstrated that. Um, so there is that. But my book, you know, just traces the Panthers as they go into demise because, number one, they're fighting each other. 
That's mm-hmm. all. That's you're right about that, Doctor Tom, uh, Doctor Pam. It is always a problem when you start fighting among each other, whether it is fighting among each other in, in, in a group like the Panthers or fighting each other as Americans. You allow a few to take over, but continue, please. Yes. Well, so um, so they were fighting each other, and then they were overtaken and I would say pretty much destroyed by cocaine. They. they one by one, um, they became cocaine addicts. They were dying from it or hospitalized from it or whatever. But it just swept through their ranks, at least in Oakland and you know the more militant aspects of the party. Um, that, that wouldn't be true necessarily across the country. Um, but the Oakland chapter was you know very militant chapter and the leading chapter. And the leaders were all addicted to cocaine, Huey P. Newton included. Um, and that destroyed them. Another issue which hurt them a lot was uh, the sexism in the party. Uh, the women members um, were often given just very menial tasks to do and expected to sleep uh, with the brothers, which they willingly did in many cases, but uh, but it was expected. It was expected, and that was a little that was demeaning, and um, um, of course, of course, doctor, that is also uh, prevalent in our society at large. Women continue to be the, the, and even though they may not say it explicitly, a lot of boardrooms. That is how a lot of women uh, feel things that they have to do to to get ahead. Yes, well, but the but the women were very much. Uh, Taken with the romance of the Panthers, right. the revolution became a romantic idea. It became, you know, without ever facing what, what that really entailed. Um, but uh, they loved the, the concept that they were going to rise up and, uh, uh, you know, smash sure. all the institutions that were oppressing them right. um, without recognizing that that would, they would lose and they would, their communities would be destroyed. And many um, people would be killed, and it would be somewhat similar to the Algerian War, where where there was right. no quarter given between two two communities, the French and the Muslim, the Arabs. There, Doctor um, Pam, we're we're running up on time, so let me ask you to do this for me. Uh, give me uh, a tell me what uh, do you expect for the person who reads your book, this particular book, When Black Panthers Prowled America, what do you want to, what's, what do you want people to get out of that book uh, with regards to the Black Panthers? What message do you want to send? Um, that the Panthers were uh, a catalyst. And as a catalyst, they made a major contribution to America. Um, but they also had their problems and uh, um, overreached in many ways. Um, and um, eventually uh, uh, brought themselves down, destroyed themselves, um, but with a lot of help from the FBI, I have to, I have to say. And, um, um, but to appreciate what they did, but also to realize that the, um, you can't lionize them, you can't glorify them, that they were really preaching violence um, and trying to uh, uh, threatening civil war and uh, um, and uh, in many cases of doing uh, unbelievable things uh, uh, along along those lines. And what would you have liked me to ask you ask you that I didn't? Um, I think you. I think you were wonderful. I think you answered all the right questions. Well, and, look, I and I, I agree with your attitude overall. <laughs> and I, I appreciate that. Now, I I just want to uh, put. Uh, and first of all, I like your closing, but I want to put one corollary onto that because I think Americans need to. More Americans uh, need to see it through the eyes of those who have been aggrieved for centuries. Violence has been since the inception of this country applied to the other. And to think that the violence from the other is any more despicable than the violence inflicted on them 
is the problem that I always have. I am a passive, I'm a pacifist in that I don't believe in violence. I always believe conversation can solve problems. But by the same same token, I will not ever just simply tell the person who is fighting back that somehow their violence is more despicable than the violence that was perpetrated upon them. That is the thing I think if Americans were more empathetic in seeing these things, we wouldn't have violence on any side. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and but but they had to they had to, the white community needed a jolt. Yes, they did. They needed, they needed to be scared. Yes, they, they did. To see the, the consequences of what was going on in in the ghettos of Oakland and the ghettos everywhere else. And doctor, uh, yeah, clear. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, doc, doctor, uh, doctor Pam, it's been my pleasure speaking to you, and I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation too. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.